Welcome to Innovation Insiders. I'm here with Mars Serra. She's the head of the R&D Accelerator team at Nestle Research in Lausanne, with over 15 years of experience leading innovation and technical teams in the food industry. Um, she really stands at the forefront of food tech and nutritional science. And having had the pleasure to work with her for several years, it's super exciting to have you here in the podcast, Mar. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So let's kick it off straight away with a uh, first question. Could you describe the the main objective of the Nestle R&D Accelerator and how it fits into the, the broader innovation strategy of, of a food giant like Nestle? Sure. So... In the accelerator, we have mainly two two pillars, I would say. So the first and most obvious is like bring innovation faster to market, uh, which we are very passionate about. But then also we play this role of really developing entrepreneurial and agile innovation mindset as well in, in, in for all of our employees. And, and, you know, so in general, what we do is the risk uh, innovation opportunities in white spaces, areas where we maybe are not uh, playing today. And, and, you know, that results maybe in product launches, but also sometimes it helps only to inspire the strategy and, and be able to refine the, the strategy for the longer term. Okay. And could you walk me through some of the process of how you translate those let's say, disruptive food science and nutrition into consumer products in, in just a few months? Mm -hmm. So we, we use several um, agile methodologies, um, but all in all, what it was very new when we started in the accelerator is really starting with the problem, right? Uh, it's all about having science and technology at the core, but first of all, you need to start. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Is it an important problem for the consumers? What are their pain points? So we start really with this uh, problem uh, and then using digital tools and agile methodology, then we, we spend a, a good amount of time on this, what we call the discovery phase, which is identifying the problem and then co-creating with consumers um, potential, you know, what would be the best, let's say, value proposition. And, and that's, that's where the magic of translation happens, right? When we are co-creating, we go to search what science do we have that is proprietary and protected and how can that, that serve to, to solve a particular uh, pain point. And then um, our program doesn't stop here, right? It still goes into putting the product into shelf. Uh, so that's, I would say, the second part of, of, of all of our projects, which is much more executional in terms of producing the product and really discussing with customers to, to put the product on, on shelf. Yeah, it's, it's it's nice. I've I've seen it uh, several times, and it's it's really nice to see that you can really turn science into opportunities that fast. Uh, and I think the the idea of making sure that the the scientific discoveries that you have really turn into commercial launches in the end is something that's that's extremely powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's. Uh, Something that obviously it's it's it sounds easier said than done. So um, <laughs> I, I wonder, have you seen some some big challenges in accelerating the development of of some solutions? And and could you tell me a bit more about what was the hardest part of of setting up this this process? Mm -hmm. So as you say, it's it's extremely rewarding when you see the science or that technology that has been cooking for years, right? And then finally uh, coming to life in a product that is really making someone's life better. That's extremely rewarding. And, and this last stretch, I was saying, really producing and putting the product to sell, to, to shelf or into a web shop. This is really our secret sauce in the program, right? And, and of course, it, it, it's, it brings much more value than testing only digitally because it's what we call the moment of truth. Um, it's really consumer behavior. Will people pick the product and pay for it or not, right? So, so it's extremely valuable in terms of learnings. Uh, when it comes to challenges, of course, that means that all the products, even if we go very fast, uh, they have to be food safety compliant. They need to be regulatory compliant. So these are big challenges that we overcome, of course, by leveraging our expertise. We have amazing experts in the company that are very dedicated and passionate about what we do, so they help tremendously. But that's something that 
it's it's hard sometimes to find the right balance of speed, but of course we cannot compromise quality and, and food safety. I would say that's one of the one of the challenges. And then the other is if you think about the science that that we that we bring to life, uh, sometimes it's very complex science, and and translating that very quickly in in something that consumers can understand and is plain consumer language is also probably um, a big challenge. But it, what really makes the difference on on being differentiated in in the market, right? But doing that fast and not being able to retest uh, things. Uh, a lot sometimes it, it can be a challenge as well yeah of course and, and these challenges only get more difficult when you're such a global company right you you test the science in mm -hmm. one region but the response of consumers in one region versus the other might differ as well as the science might not be as as popular or as, as relevant in another region absolutely i mean as you say this is definitely a challenge but i would say it's really an advantage on the way our company is organized is that we are very big, but we are very well connected. So we have arms in every region, if you will, and, and we have contact with the local, you know, regulatory teams or quality teams or commercial teams. So, so it's very much this collaborative culture is very much in our DNA and, and that allows us to, to operate in a global scale. Otherwise it would be <laughs> probably impossible. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to see that you've you've really opened uh, several centers all around the world with the same principles, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and knowing that everybody's connected really really helps, of course, to share learnings mm -hmm. and and maybe even transfer one science from one region to the other. Exactly, exactly. We operate really as a as a network. Yeah. Awesome. And can you maybe share a success story of a product that came out of the accelerator that you're really proud of? Sure. Um, I would say one recent example that I'm very proud of, of, of a project that we had in, in Lausanne um, was our first like digital um, product, right? So uh, as a food and beverage company, we are very focused on uh, food and beverage uh, as part of our value propositions, but we have to embrace digital. We have to embrace that consumers expect more than, than, than just a, a product. So uh, last year we embarked on this project that that was really related to um, to well being and and gut health and and we were able to complement that with with a digital service. It was the first time that we had to learn really with our resources how can we come up with a digital MVP. So we definitely have some expertise, but it was new to us to do it in such a, a quick uh, turnaround. And it was very rewarding to see that, yeah, the, that was also put in shop test. So we saw how many people would come to that website and leverage this service and get educated and, and so on. And it was the numbers were really, really good. So uh, and now this digital product is being scaled. So that's something I'm very proud about because it's really moving the needle to to more 360, let's say, value propositions. Um, and then I think in general, it's not such a concrete example, but that's what I said before. It's, it's, we have a lot of cases of pro, uh, projects we've worked on that maybe it doesn't translate in an immediate launch because we work on these, you know, further, um, uh, goals. If you, if you say, if you win, but, um, but really we've been able to inspire the strategy, right? So with the results out of the test that we've done, our business partners, could refine their strategies on particular territories and be much more, much more targeted. And I think that is something I'm proud of because this is what it's all about, right? Or of making uh, more robust and more strategic business plans for, for higher impact. Yeah. Yeah. It's not only about the, the product itself, although it always starts from a scientific discovery, the, the business model and the way on how you go to market is, is equally as is important. Exactly. Now, and I've seen it that you've you've done. There's there's some work that that has happened elsewhere as well uh, within Nestle, where where you've really worked on all the different channels from from vending machines in store testing online, but even through social media to really find to to A B test at first. So to to mm -hmm. really see what's the best approach to approach our customers and to see what works best, but as well to to uncover new business models or, or channels that you can reach out to uh, to consumers for the for the actual launch. So 
That's um, right. It, and, and that's what I was saying with, this is our secret sauce, because when you put the product in the market, you can decide which type of stores, how many you can explore new channels. So as I mentioned before, there are some challenges that come with it, but the learnings you can get to really de-risk your real launch where you're going to put much more resources behind, it's, it's, it's priceless. And maybe um, taking a, a step back on the, the first parts of the innovation process, like how do you ensure that innovations from accelerators continue to meet the, the needs of consumers as they change rapidly? And they also, for example, there's, there's, there's this big say-do gap between co what consumers will tell you they like, but will they actually buy this? Um, so curious to know a bit more about how you, how you really make sure that, that the products really meet those, those new consumer needs. Mm -hmm. So in our, as in our projects, we really start, as I say, with, with the problem, but then we, to, un to understand the problem, the best way is to get closer to the consumer, right? So for us, one way to, to stay relevant is really always sends the polls, right? So we always have to go where the consumer is. And that means interviewing them and understanding them and spending time with them, doing immersions with them. Um, and, and then uh, further along the journey is really having this co-creation process, right? So it's not that, okay, we get insights and then in our office, we come up with a potential solution, right? It is this constant feedback loop and this, um, this, co this co-creation uh, process where we kind of uh, gain and reassure ourselves, okay, so we are tracking in the right direction. But then the ultimate, the ultimate moment of truth is when you put it out there to, to buy. And, and yeah, either it's in the web shop or, or in the store, like we have many different ways that we still get in contact with consumers. So we combine a lot of qualitative with quantitative data that, that we get to make sure that, that, that yeah, that, that we are staying relevant. Um, because in the end, we know yeah, it, it's not so much how many units we buy, for example, but really understanding, are we making it better than anyone else that is being there or than the current solutions they are using, right? And if we can crack that, you know, even if we have to pivot, then, then it's still, we, still we know we are in the right direction and then we have some chances to, to succeed. But yeah, overall, it's really staying close to the consumer. The, the teams travel a significant amount to, to be in the market and to be close to to consumers. Yeah, and it's 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 really not theory. That's the that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. It's not just um, doing research and then defining a persona and then doing everything based on that. It's it's about getting the consumer really into the room and uh, and talking to them and getting feedback in the early stages and later stages. So it's really nice to see that it's it's done done even within such a short amount of time um, and. Maybe uh, transitioning into the the evolution of where such accelerators go to, um, could you do you see a role of of new emerging technologies, for example, like AI, in developing new food solutions? So, I mean, we live in the era of technology, and I don't think you can work on innovation and avoid technology, right? So, so yes, we we leverage um, technology in a sin yeah, significantly from from digital that allows us to reach many, many uh, consumers to, to, yeah, we are exploring, of course, what can AI really help us uh, um, accelerate or be more efficient on. Uh, and, and in all the aspects, I mean, there is the power on understanding the consumer and gaining the insights, but there is also a lot of technologies on product design or packaging design that these are also very lengthy projects with a lot of variables. So there is also quite a lot of opportunity there. So yeah, definitely we are, uh, we are constantly uh, exploring what's available for, for some areas. We, we develop the technology ourselves. So um, that's how we embrace uh, digital on, on uh, being more uh, innovative on the way we do some of our core, let's say, uh, uh, areas uh, of product development and more technical areas and we partner with with other um with other um partners that, that have the expertise more on the on the front end yeah and it's it's nice to see that through the use of technology you've been able to to um 
to speed up the innovation process as well, not only by time boxing mm -hmm. it, but also by by using technologies to to reach out fast to consumers. But I, I strongly mm -hmm. believe that that AI can really be can accelerate this even further from customer discovery and understanding all the way to to new designs. So, so super yeah, excited. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And maybe with that, like if we bring it back to the the product itself, like. Also on the the technological side, um, there's there's continuously new scientific discoveries, but it's hard to prioritize what science to use or what's what technology to um, to really focus on. How do you prioritize such things? <laughs> so we have quite a robust process around what does the accelerator work on, right? So as I said, it has a very specific role to play into acceleration, in, into accelerating innovation in, into the market. And that's, um, that's why we have, we work very, very close with, um, with our strategy teams to, to make sure that we are in the right direction, right? So we have specific areas that are identified that as a group we want to go after. And then we have very strategic and, and intentional discussions on how should we split the efforts. And um, uh, so some, some centers will go more into, uh, into more uh, immediate innovation. And then to us, they will come when it comes to really, okay, how can we play in that space in a very differentiated way, you know, really exploring new health benefits or, or things that require much more science um, discovery, but also um, clinical data or you name it, right? So, but it's, it's very important for us, uh, it's mandatory for us to, to, to make sure we are aligned with the strategies so that we are right, working in the right territories. Because in the end also we, I mean, we have multi-million dollar brands and, and we wanna evolve that brand in the right direction, right? So. It's not that we, we love our brands. We don't want to create uh, 50 new brands, right? So it's about innovation within, within, our, uh, within our territories. And that's why also it's very important that we discuss with our strategy partners, which are the brands that we see fitting better in this type of territories and that we want to explore in detail. Hmm. And, if, and if you would look at the whole process, it's, it's, we've, we've discussed the more technical side, I guess, but in the end, it's also a people business. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, interesting to see that very often the team starts from a scientific team, like food science experts, yet there's there's a lot of diverse profiles involved as well, from marketing uh, all the way to, to different parts of the, of the business. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that you attract the right talent, but also motivate those cross-functional teams to, to achieve an objective that is actually like often um, hard to achieve in such a short amount of time? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> it's um, look, innovation is not for everyone, right? That's that's clear. Um, and I think innovators or entrepreneurs they they are almost a piece a bit of on on its own, right? So you need to have incredible passion and and resilience to to thrive in that environment, right? Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for, for my team of, we call them innovation coaches or venture builders, right? So they are tremendously entrepreneurial and brilliant and, and, and they really uh, um, have a lot of energy to, to motivate the teams. But in the end, what we have observed is that, I mean, this type of traits, they don't come only from people working in innovation. We, we have very entrepreneurial people in quality and regulatory, right? In the end, when they have the right, be, you know, they, they are compelled with the vision of, yeah, I really wanna be a change maker and help bring this innovation. They know that the, the, the motivation almost happens uh, naturally, right? So so we we take a lot of care of, of our culture because we know it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, um, but I would say, we don't deal so much with the motivated uh, people. I mean, they, they just want to be part of it, right? And as I said, it's not for everyone, but we are open to any employee uh, and, and whoever wants to come and, and has the right traits, uh, they, they will thrive in our environment. Okay. How, how did you end up in, in the, the innovation side and accelerator side? So good question. So I, I spent the last uh, 10 years 
working in, in innovation, so but more on the operation side. So I was more uh, bringing the products to life, right? So uh, either in, 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 in local market roles or more regional roles. So it was much more the executional part. Um, so I knew how that part works very, very well. Uh, and then um, for me coming to the accelerator was like, okay, I want to really uh, get into doing the same, executing and bringing it to life, but may maybe uh, working on spaces that are less uh, obvious for, for our brand. So I'm a scientist as background, so uh, and I turn into more uh, operations and, and business. And and yeah, being back in, in Nestle Research in Lausanne, it's, I... I it made me realize how much I love science, right? So, so it's kind of bringing the best of two worlds, really cool science and technology, uh, coupled with, uh, with, you know, good execution and, and solid business plan. So it's, um, for me, it's a perfect environment. <laughs> awesome. And maybe as a, as a final question, do you have any advice on what you would give to innovation executives to, uh, to look at? how they can launch uh, such initiatives in their organizations? So in our experience or in my experience, um, the beauty of the accelerator is that it's the safest and the cheapest way to experiment and de risk your innovation, right? So you can play with brands, you can play with different formats, different communication, different pricing. So. This is, you, you don't have that in the regular business world where either you launch or you don't launch, right? It's, you just have these two options. We, we work in a space that while we test everything in real market conditions, it's still very, very controlled. So it's very low risk for, for our brands. So I would say anyone that is considering to, to set this up, I, I, I would recommend really they, they go for it because it's this... Um, very low risk, very low resource, uh, both people and also financial compared to what it means bringing it in the in the regular, let's say, innovation engines uh, in the company that are also very necessary. But when you want to, you know, um, discover a space where you're not yet playing uh, and you don't even know which brand you're going to use or how you're going to sell, the learnings you get through through an, a setup like that are are priceless. So that would be the the advice. And I think the other thing I would say is that you have to be patient, right? Because if you want to work on disruptive innovations, this is not the same as running a, a core business, right? In an established brand or in established channels. And so that's always the, 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 the right balance of, uh, yeah, building the knowledge and, and the, the reassurance that you can win in the market. But but it might take some time to see the results you want to see, right? So you have to be you have to be a bit patient. Awesome, thanks. It's I think it's it's really impressive what you've what you've built, and um, and always been been super excited to be to be part of it for for some parts, and uh, and, and love to follow your work uh, in the future. And, and thanks for for joining the episode. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Innovation Insiders. We hope today's conversation sparks your ambition to push the boundaries of what's possible. This podcast is an initiative of Board of Innovation. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate or leave a review. Your feedback keeps us inspired and motivated to bring you more insights.